We are an event tonight with uh, Judy Bentley um, on her book called Hiking Washington's History. And um, some of you know, some of you may not have heard, there's a bomb threat currently going on in downtown Leavenworth. Uh, so we're a nice small group here. People are joining us virtually from the safety of their homes. But if something changes with the evacuation level of downtown and the Leavenworth area, then we will all leave. But we're here now, and we will enjoy Judy's talk uh, in the moment. So we're going to start our event tonight with a land acknowledgement. And this was created alongside the Pascosa Wenatchee people. So we're spreading the message that they wish to be spread to the public. The land Wenatchee River Institute sits on is the ancestral homelands of the Shimpishkwashu, Piscosa, or Wenatchee people. The Shimpishkwashu, meaning people in between, had villages positioned along the Wenatchee River. Their ancestral homeland extends from the Cascade Ridge throughout what is now known as the Wenatchee and Okanagan Valleys. The culture and economy of the Piscosa people centers on fishing. They also gather roots and berries, basket making materials and medicines, and they also hunt game. The Piscosa are named within the Yakima Treaty of 1855. Language to establish the Wenatchee Reservation was never followed through, even with the needed surveying completed. Many Piscosa now live on the Colville Reservation, 150 miles northeast of Leavenworth. And you can see that on the PowerPoint, uh, the Colville Reservation is outlined in red, and all of the other colorful land is the ancestral homelands of the 12 bands that were forced onto the Colville Reservation. The Piscosa people are still alive today. They continue to practice their culture within their homelands and are working to get land back. The Piscosa people are the original, original stewards of this land. And we offer this land acknowledgement as the first step to amplifying Indigenous voices and recognizing the harm done to them as a people. We encourage everyone to learn about the Indigenous peoples of the place that you now call home. And the Wenatchee River Institute is committed to sharing this land acknowledgement and following up with other actions to educate and be respectful. Thank you for listening. Could you just give an idea of where we are in relation to that, sort of like over? Sure. Over yeah. So um, for the hybrid virtual people, there's a question on where we are. And I don't know if they're going to see, they're not going to see my pointer. But Leavenworth, oh, there's everybody's phones going off. If Oh, yeah. OK. Yeah. <laughs> It does say Division Street, um, which we are on Division Street, <laughs> um, sheltering in place. So I guess we are, we are sheltering. <laughs> yeah. So if, um, if everyone feels comfortable with staying here, they are requesting us to shelter in place. So we will continue with this with it. Um, I guess maybe you shouldn't leave if you want because they're <laughs> asking us not to leave. <laughs> um, but I do recognize, yeah, this might be like, you know, elevating folks' stress. So we just want to recognize that, you know, deep breaths. Um, but we'll just keep monitoring as we go. Back to nature. Yes. So back to the map. Um, Leavenworth. So this is the Wenatchee Reservation here, um, or sorry, it should have been the Wenatchee Reservation. This is their ancestral homelands, and Leavenworth is like over here. Oh, so it's really not that far. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you're welcome. So I'm Rachel. I'm the Community Programs Manager here at Wenatchee River Institute. And for those of you who don't know who we are, we're a nonprofit, and our mission is to connect people, communities, and the natural world. And we do that through community programs such as Red Barn events and workshops and seasonal guided nature walks and a bunch of other things. And then we also have a, a large um, youth programs uh, part of what we do. So um, Last week, our executive director sent an email to all staff after she was doing number crunching for her board packet. 
And uh, she told us how many people we interacted with in the last 30 days. And it's really quite amazing. Um, 727 students in our youth programs were taught and then 343 people came to community programs. So, and that's again, just in the last 30 days. So we are very, very busy right now, having a great time um, teaching and interacting with folks. And we thank you for coming and attending our programs. Yeah. Great. Great, thank you, Jackie. No, no problem. You don't need to apologize. <laughs> okay, yeah, she's gonna sneak right past. <laughs> yeah, okay. So I just want to take a moment to thank the sponsors who help make our Red Barn events happen. You can see all their logos up behind me on the Leavenworth Chamber of Commerce. North Central Washington Audubon Society, the Rhine House, South Restaurants, Sage Mountain Natural Foods, Ludwig's German Restaurant, and Icicle Brewing, and Wild Birds Unlimited in Wenatchee, the Sweets on Main, Visconti's Italian Restaurant, Cured by Visconti, the Bubblery, Gibbs Graphics, Leavenworth Rad Tours, and Bruner's Lodge. So all of these businesses and organizations are super passionate about us having Red Barn events and um, making them available to the public for free. So um, yeah, we show support, thank them if you interact with them at all. Great. Um, before I introduce Judy, our presenter tonight, uh, these are just some upcoming events we have. Uh, next week, this is an event that we just added onto the calendar, March 31st. It's um, uh, Upper Valley updates with some local representatives. So Bob Bugert, who's a county commissioner, Carl Flore, who's the mayor of Leavenworth, and a couple other county employees will be here. Um, it starts a little earlier. It's actually going to start at 6 p.m. instead of 7. And they're giving updates on a bunch of stuff like um, uh, tubing on the Icicle River and some new thing that's called the Wenatchee River Whitewater Park. Um, so if you want to know more about that and what that is, <laughs> you can come or watch from home because it's also a hybrid event. And then in April, we're partnering with Waste Loop and Sustainable Wenatchee for a red barn on composting with, with red wigglers. So that's composting you can do indoors the whole year, uh, so even in the winter, which is great. And lastly, um, another one in April, April 9th, we're having a talk um, about mason, how to raise mason bees in your backyard. So they're um, a little bit finicky. I think they live in these little tubes and then they come out and they need pollen like immediately. So, uh, you know, you sort of have to time it with what's growing in your backyard and then they get put away at a different time of the year stored until you put them back outside. So uh, Jim Ulrich is gonna teach us all about that. Great. So um, tonight we're running this event hybrid, like I said. So if you are watching virtually, please um, use the Q&A and chat feature to write your questions in for Judy and she's gonna answer questions from everyone at the end of her presentation. Great. So Judy Bentley taught Pacific Northwest history at South Seattle College for more than 20 years. She is an avid hiker and author of 15 young adult books, as well as two guides to hiking and walking Washington history published by the University of Washington Press. So we're super happy to have Judy here. She was here like 12 years ago presenting in the Red Barn when it looked very different here at WRI. So we're happy to have her back. So Judy, come on up. Well, thank you. It's good to be here with a captive audience. <laughs> <laughs> Beer, wine, history, photographs of the great outdoors. So I hope we'll do okay. So <laughs> we'll just proceed. 
Um, this is the second edition of Hiking Washington's History. It has a new name on the cover. Uh, I uh, didn't think there would ever be a second edition. I thought historic hikes don't change that much, but in fact, there are some new historic hikes. Uh, access has changed to some hikes. And with Craig Romano's help, um, this has more detailed hike instructions. So uh, I've made it more of a guidebook, but kept the history, which was, which was my interest in it. Um, I appreciated the land acknowledgement uh, that you gave. Um, this is uh, Ken Workham of the Duwamish tribe. I live in West Seattle and uh, Ken has led walks, we call it walking native land in the West Duwamish Greenbelt. Um, and I would just add that the um, Wenatchee people, I don't say the name as well, <laughs> the name that they call themselves as well, uh, had fishing and still have fishing rights here right at the confluence of the uh, Icicle River and um, the Wenatchee River. So this is definitely uh, a homeland. Um, and the icicle name comes from their original name, which was not icicle, but if you take off the end and at the beginning and the end, it begins to sound like icicle. So um, this uh, was named by Hal Sylvester, whom we will meet a little bit later. So uh, I wanna talk a little bit about how I got into this book. Uh, when I'm hiking, I wanna know who's been there before. Uh, why is this trail here? Uh, where has it gone? Where does it go now? Who, who built it or who created it just by walking? And uh, what's, what's the story here? And where do I fit in on it? Uh, Cause I hike for solitude, <laughs> get away from people, exercise, get into the great outdoors. But I'm also, I think, searching for uh, my place here. Uh, we moved out to the Northwest in 1981. Seems like a long time ago now, but uh, still, I think if we all folks knew who haven't been here for generations, uh, want to find our place. So this is a search for, for a place too. Um, whenever uh, James Rasmussen of the Duwamish tribe introduces himself, he starts with, he goes back, parents grandparents, great-grandparents, great-great-grandparents, all having lived in the same land. And I find that so uh, I'm jealous of that, that, mm -hmm. that sense of, of rootedness that he brings. So, so we'll do our best to, to find our own place. So we moved here, we moved to the suburbs, um, Bellevue and uh, suburban development. Uh, but I could walk out the front door and follow uh, what the Bellevue city planners told me was a social trail, a trail that's created by people walking. It's also a deer trail and just uh, follow it into what I would have called the woods uh, from my Indiana background. And I was in deep into a ravine uh, and you had no idea that there was a development of homes up on one side and Coal Creek Parkway on the other. Instead, uh, you felt like you were out in the, in the outdoors um, with waterfalls like this. But then you came across something like this, a big lump of coal right beside the trail. Mm -hmm. and, <laughs> yeah. and then a sign, which is no longer there, but uh, the sign locomotive turntable. Now, what in the world is this sign doing out here in this uh, suburb and uh, down, down along this creek? named Coal Creek, of course. So there's a clue there. Uh, and sure enough, this is the remains of the locomotive uh, turntable. And I learned about this history from the Newcastle Historical Society who would have Newcastle uh, days in which they would do guided tours of the area because indeed this was uh, the Pittsburgh of the West uh, in the late 1800s. There was uh, a lot of coal mined out of this area named Newcastle for of course, Newcastle, England. Uh, more than a thousand people living in this area, uh, living a pretty rough life, and they were miners. There's nothing romantic and glamorous about that. Um, and you would come to a big hole in the woods, <laughs> hole in the ground here. Um, this was an air shaft. And when there was a fire in the mines, uh, the way the miners could get out is, is climbing up such an air shaft. So it's pretty, pretty dramatic history. Um, and uh, the good thing about this hole in the ground is that if you look down, there is a concrete floor to it. So you're not going to fall into a mine. But this is what got me into, well, if this is here, what else, what else is around? So I began um, spending my summers while I was teaching uh, hiking and um, reading guidebooks like Harvey Manning's and to find uh, his, his description of some of the older trails and to see what I could find. 
1853, this is the first map of Washington Territory done probably by our surveyor general, James Tilton. And maybe you can see uh, very faintly, where to go? Yes. Oh, 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 okay, right. Now where? Oh, up on the ceiling, there we go. Okay, here's the trail uh, coming uh, off the Columbia River here. This is the Natchez Pass Trail uh, to Puget Sound. This is a, goes through Natchez Pass. Um, this was uh, a Native American trail, a fur trading trail. And then the first wagon train, um, one of the first wagon trains, 1853, the Longmire Party came through Natchez Pass. So here on our first, uh, I do any better there. <laughs> On our first uh, uh, map shows a, a trail that has already gone through, uh, evolved through different kinds of, of uses. Does that relate to Highway 2 at all? No. Okay. It it's down by, I'll show, I'll show the road that goes through, well, not through there today. Um, this is actually a, a hike that was in the first book uh, that I've had to take out because it's so degraded by vehicle use that mm -hmm. it's not a good hiking trail anymore. But there's a section of it in uh, Federation Forest State Park, and I put that in instead. And I'll show you what the trail uh, looked like uh, 80 years ago. Let me get to it. So I want to give you, I'm going to give you an overview of kind of what's an historic trail anyhow, what, what kinds of history are on trails. Um, this is book is statewide, so we'll, we'll roam all over the state. Um, I'll talk just a very little bit about the trails close to here. And then I will focus on just one or two of my favorite trails to give you a little more, more depth. So this is the survey to begin with. So we start uh, with very uh, game trails, as I said. Uh, Lieutenant Joseph P. O'Neill, 1891, he's following elk, uh, an elk trail, trying to find an east-west route over the Olympic Mountains, um, looking for mineral wealth, also just looking for can we build a, a, mule a mule road over the mountains and get there east to west. So he follows an elk trail and then all of a sudden it disappears and, and he can't figure out where the elk have gone uh, and how to get through, how mules are going to get over the mountains. But he then discovers what's called O'Neill Pass. Uh, it takes him a, couple, a week or so of sending out teams and finally realizing how the elk had gotten through. So he's following the old game trails. Uh, of course, much of our hiking um, over the Cascades, the Cascades are the big barrier for transportation for anyone. So we're using the trails over the Cascades were Native American trails. And there are, there are at least 10 Native American trails that have been documented over the uh, Cascades in Washington state. And six of them are in the book. This is one is Cascade Pass. I have to mention my friend Kay Forsyth, who went over this past with me uh, originally, and, um, and some other hikes too. Um, Cowlitz Pass is in the book, Snoqualmie Pass, Yakima Pass, Natchez Pass, a uh, little section of it, and Sispas Pass uh, was also in the first edition. So um, this is six out of the 10, but because these are the oldest trails, they're the most fascinating, and plus they get us into the mountains, which is uh, where a lot of people want to be. But the first trails were really, whoops, went too fast, by water. Uh, first exploration and the first peoples here got around by water. It's much easier actually to get in a canoe and, and up a river than to, than to climb uh, uh, on foot. So especially explorations by Europeans and Americans are coming uh, along the coast, looking for a way into the country. This is Cape Flattery. Anybody been there? Oh, great. Oh, this is okay. I should have tested my audience. I could see you're you uh, and an experienced audience already. I love this little trail, very short trail, uh, because it was our first acquaintance with the Pacific Ocean. Uh, when my children were quite young, my son was four, and we were going along this trail, which at that time was not well constructed. And you just heard the roar of the ocean and all that was on either side was Salau. That's all that's keeping you from falling off these cliffs. So, but it's now a much uh, better maintained trail, uh, the Macaw got some money from an oil spill settlement and they've, uh, they have really upgraded the trail of all things. But this was, this is the Northwestern edge of the continental United States. Uh, you think that you're at the edge of the world and the McCall call it the beginning of the world because they traded extensively um, and, and knew these waters very well. Uh, James Cook thought that he was getting, I uh, flattered himself 
that he was finding a safe harbor here. Mm -hmm. And that's why he named it Cape Flatter. He did not, he had to go on to Vancouver Island. Um, George Vancouver, speaking of which, came through in 1792. Um, he's sailed uh, or found this uh, body of water here, which he thought must be the tip of a peninsula. And, but he sent his Lieutenant uh, Joseph Whitby around uh, to check it out and would be discovered it was an island, uh, not a peninsula. So, um, so uh, Vancouver called it Deception Pass. <laughs> I love that these explorers are kind of constantly being deceived by, by what they find. Uh, and of course, the, you know, the, one of the most uh, familiar explorations, early explorations is Lewis and Clark coming out in 1805. Uh, and again, they're coming out, especially by water. They're following the Snake River and they're following the Columbia. On the way back, they go somewhat by land, but you won't find the Lewis and Clark Trail is a water trail. You won't find their footprints. Um, they did follow the Nez Perce Trail going back, which is an overland trail, but there's nothing of that that you can hike today. You can find some of their campsites, but you can't hike that trail. So this is Clark, I believe, yes. Um, uh, he found a giant sturgeon on the coast. Uh, and so this is, uh, the people of Ilwaco and Long Beach have this wonderful discovery trail, which uh, once Lewis and Clark got out here, they saw the ocean, they, they spent a day or two exploring and he walked along the beach and you can follow, you know, the same route, <laughs> not same footsteps, but the route along the beach. It's a very nice trail at Cape, Cape Disappointment. Here we are again with the, uh, the names that we tend to give these. Uh, if you were inland, however, trying to uh, uh, explore, you couldn't, there, you, couldn't, you couldn't go up the Columbia, too many rapids at the time. So you were forced uh, overland um, through something like the Grand Coulee, this big gulch, <laughs> huge gulch in the middle of, of, the, of, of the territory. Um, and uh, Paul Kane, who was an artist, went through here in 1847, uh, found a quite an astounding place to hike. It was like a canyon with thundering walls, um, not much water. Uh, you find, you know, this is not prime hiking territory in a sense, because it's hard to get to water. Today, plenty of water. This is Banks Lake uh, filling the Grand Coulee from the Grand Coulee Dam. And right out in the middle is Steamboat Rock, a beautiful uh, formation, which you don't have to cross the water to get to. Uh, you can drive uh, Steamboat Rock State Park and get to the base of Steamboat Rock. And if you can get up the pretty slippery with sand uh, slope, you can roam around on top. Everybody came through here. That's why I call it a, a, uh, an historic trail here. There's a signpost that will tell you all the names of the people who explored here in the 1800s. And then we go back to the Olympics uh, mountains. O'Neill was going east to west, but this is the press expedition that went north to south through the Olympics um, 1890, just a year before O'Neill, they were enlisted by the Seattle Press, a newspaper which was building somewhat on the Livingston idea of looking for uh, unexplored and very remote sections. And at this point in the 1890s, the Olympic Peninsula, Olympic Mountains in particular, were quite unknown. There were no known uh, Native American trails through the Olympics because of cataclysms of nature, which are probably earthquakes, um, people tended to avoid this, but uh, the press enlisted these, they uh, advertised for men of vim and vigor, and here they are, um, <laughs> and they went north to south through the Olympics they, in the winter. Uh, they pulled their uh, goods along on sleds to begin with um, over the snow. I actually found the snow easier going perhaps than, than mud but it took them several months. Uh, they almost starved until they shot a bear finally. And, and that's the food. they got off track, um, but you can follow the press expedition through the, up the Elwha River and through the Olympics today. So this is kind of the age of exploration, the end of the age of exploration. And we get to um, the use of uh, trails uh, for fur trade and then for commerce, uh, particularly of uh, the building of military roads. Some of the first non-native settlements in this area were around the military posts, Fort Vancouver, Fort Dalles uh, in Oregon. And you can cross the river at the Dalles to Dalles Port and head up an ancient Indian trail uh, to what is now Fort Simcoe on the Yakima Reservation. 
So this was a, an ancient Indian trail, then it became a military road. And this is a Columbia Hill State Park. It's one of my favorite hikes. Uh, it's very open. You only go spring or fall. You wouldn't hit it for <laughs> summer or winter. Um, but you can follow sections of the military road from the Columbia River then up to, uh, you can't get all the way on, on a trail, but through this park, there's a section of the military road. Following military roads, you get wagon roads. Um, this is the Snoqualmie wagon road. David and Arthur Denny, who were part of the landing group at uh, Alki in 1850, um, also had mining interests up at Snoqualmie Pass, so they wanted a road. Plus, Eastern Washington uh, also wanted to, a road across Snoqualmie Pass so that they could uh, sell their goods and products and get them to market. So this was built in 1867. Six wagons went through, and portions of it are still there today. You can follow a section. Uh, it kept getting washed out, and today it still gets washed out. So <laughs> you're, you're familiar with that from around here, I'm sure. Uh, White Bluffs had a wagon road on the 1860s. This was uh, commerce coming up the river from Portland, up the Columbia from Portland. And then from the west side of the Columbia where it turns north, uh, I don't have a map to show you, but uh, you, know, you know the Columbia curves and, and goes north. So to get from the west side to the east side, there was a ferry uh, from the town of White Bluffs over then to the east side. And this, um, Mule teams with mule teams carrying as many, having as many as 50 mules on one team carrying 5,000 pounds of freight. We're going to um, the east side, then north over the Saddle Mountains up to mining camps, basically in, in uh, Idaho and in northeastern Washington. Um, here's another wagon road that developed. This is the Scheibner grade. It's a 1902 built with hand tools, just picks and shovels, people carving this out of the hillside. This is at Northrop Canyon, just across from Steamboat Rock. And today you can hike into the canyon or you can follow this old road. And it's really hard to imagine that it was wide enough for a road. And it was a fairly risky trip, but here's a family making a uh, traveling on that road um, in the early 1900s. Uh, sheep and cattle trails, of course, um, uh, sheep going into the mountains, cattle going from central Washington, having fed, uh, have, having fattened here, and then going north, uh, for example, to the Caribou uh, gold mines. Uh, so a cattle drive called the Caribou Trail developed, and it, today it follows up Highway 97 uh, through the Okanagan Valley. This is just a small portion of it uh, called, this is McLaughlin Canyon named after a son of uh, John McLaughlin, uh, who was half Native American. He was leading a group of miners over what was Native American land, had not been ceded by treaty. Um, they were met with an ambush uh, through this part. They had to go through the narrow canyon away from the river at one point. Uh, and they, there was a, a one day battle there, kind of a, a, an, you know, a symbolic of the kind of clashes that were really going on over land. Uh, so miners in the mining rush were, were pretty willing to take uh, the risk of, of and, and the intrusion of going across land that had not been open to them. Uh, Canyon has had a fire, that's why it looks quite so bleak, but it's an interesting place, a uh, short walk on Bureau of Land Management land. Uh, and then we get uh, the railroads um, following the wagon roads. And I'll come back to the one you're probably most familiar with, the Iron Goat. But this is the Snoqualmie Valley Trail uh, on a typical <laughs> Northwestern day in, uh, in, in a way. I mean, it, this is not, uh, you can see how wet it was. This is a lovely trail that passes through the Snoqualmie Valley. Uh, it follows the Snoqualmie River, which is the ancient uh, path that the Snoqualmie people uh, passed. Uh, a railroad was built along at the Seattle Lakeshore and Eastern Railway, 1885, when Seattle was upset that the railroad had first come to Tacoma and they wanted to get one that came from uh, Seattle and went east. And they didn't get too far, but they got as far as North Bend. So this is a, a, long, a long white uh, walk or a, 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 a mountain bike kind of, kind of road, pretty rough stretch, but you can go for miles. And you can connect. You can connect from there to um, the Palouse to Cascade uh, route, which goes across the state now, following the Milwaukee Road. 
the uh, third major railroad that was built across the state. Uh, and so this goes from, this starts North Bend uh, and then goes all the way across the state. There are only a couple of sections still in use by the railroads and then private land. And the new, uh, the bridge at Beverly across the Columbia River has recently been opened and built so that you can, you can continue as far as you wanna go. I met a guy on the Snoqualmie Valley Trail with his dog and a cart who says that he, he had gone all the way <laughs> across the state. So it's, it's wonderful to think that there is still this kind of pathway. Of course, it's thanks to a railroad grade, but, but we don't mind the rail trails, I think. Um, and then uh, this, uh, so with the rail, one of the, one of the industries promoting railroad growth, of course, was mining. Uh, or is heavy, you have to get it to market or to a smelter. So the mining companies began to build railroad tracks too. Anybody know where this is? This is a hiking audience. No, it's not in this area. Okay, This is Monte Cristo. Uh, so you're going uh, it's off the Mountain Loop Highway out of Granite Falls. It's a wonderful hike. And when you get there, I mean, it just you're not seeing half the mountains. This place is just ringed with mountains. Um, and you follow a mine to market road, which is also part of, a, and there's a railroad grade there, there too. So Rockefeller had mining interests at Monte Cristo. Uh, there was a lot of money coming out of there, a million dollars a week worth of ore for a while. Uh, Donald Trump's grandfather had a rooming house there. Uh, he made some money on, on that. And uh, there were like 2,000 people living there in the 1890s. Today, only people living, and these are not original cabins, these are forest service cabins, but still you get the idea. You, and you can walk around and there's a whole guided tour of the home sites and the, and the concentrator, which was three stories high. Comments? Okay, <laughs> there will be time for that, but you're welcome to interrupt. Okay, uh, another mine. Um, Okay, recognizes the Black Mor uh, Warrior Mine, which was active into the 1950s. This is between Cascade Pass and Stahican. And in fact, part of the trail you're following over Cascade Pass, which was a, was a Native American route, but then there were mining roads built up as far as the Black Warrior Mine. So the second part of the trail is, is a mining road. Um, and then uh, Roslyn uh, develops as a, uh, a railroad and a coal mining center. The uh, Northern Pacific Railroad, the first intercontinental railroad out here in 1883, uh, was looking for coal uh, be, to fuel the, the engine. So they uh, found it in Roslyn. Uh, it became a company town um, and hired a lot of miners from all over Europe and different kinds of, of ethnicities. The cemetery is full of more than 20 different ethnic uh, sections. Um, but then when the European uh, American miners went on strike, the company brought in African-American strike breakers from the South who did not know that they were coming to break a strike. Um, they settled in Roslyn, they, uh, the strike ended, some people left. Um, Others stayed, and the, many of the black miners stayed. Uh, they got lower wages than the whites, um, but and they lived largely in Ronald. But uh, Roslyn, then this is the largest African American community in the state uh, at that time, had the first black mayor in the, in the state too. And you can see, uh, well, this family of pioneers. Uh, so moving into the 1900s, at least. Uh, early 1900s, we had a lot of fire in the forest here. Yakult Burns State Park uh, is built on a forest fire uh, that raged in 1902. There are trails there, one of the trails in there. Uh, and as a result, the state began building an extensive uh, system of lookouts. Uh, at one time, there were more than 600 lookouts, uh, fire watch cabins in the state. Only a few still standing today and even fewer in use because uh, there's much more aerial surveillance, but there is a lot of romantic uh, uh, romanticism around lookouts. Everybody loves to hike to a lookout, and if you can stay there, that's even better. Anybody know where this one is? Right. So it's still no, I mean you, you got 600 guesses, so <laughs> <laughs> they're not all still standing. This is Desolation Peak in the North Cascades. Had a famous resident there in the 50s, Jack Kerouac. 
Um, and this one's in the uh, first edition, and I got tired of Jack Kerouac, and I, <laughs> and I, in the second edition, I put the sourdough. So, uh, <laughs> because that's where Gary Schneider was and Phil Whalen. Uh, there's a wonderful book, uh, Poets on the Peaks, which talks about the fact that uh, uh, Gary Schneider, in fact, enlisted poets uh, like Kerouac and Whalen to, to be on lookout, to do lookout duty during the summer as a way of supporting themselves, but they have plenty of time to write poetry, and, and they did, so it was a nice experience. Um, Is there a particular reason why there were so many fires early in the century? Well, uh, I think probably just not fire, a little bit of fire management. I mean, I'm not sure if we compared number of fires today to what we're getting, you know, getting back then. They were much more um, extensive in their damage then. I think we were, we were able to control them better. The one that started in um, Yakult Burn was a result of the winds down there, uh, a very unusual climate conditions there. Um, it's a good question. I, 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 I don't think that it was, I don't know that that was into. I know some of the, the northern Idaho, a lot of them were a logging slash, but they'd come in through the logs and left everything there. And, you know, summer is fire season. Right. Season. That's part of what happened at Yakko. Yeah. Yeah, the, the thing that happens in, in Yakult, where people, no, more than 20, 25 or so people were killed, they were used to having smoke in the air because they were also burning uh, the wood in the fall, um, and just as, as their slash piles. And so they didn't find it unusual. They didn't realize how serious the fire was because they were used to smoke in the, smoke in the air. Yes, we'll get to that. And the question was about World War II uh, lookouts for those of you on, on the hybrid. Yes, uh, that'll be the, ne uh, the next one after this. I'll talk about this is Copper Butte in the Kettle River Range. I'm just, this is the kind of thing that it's fun to find when you hike to a, to a lookout. So the lookout is not still there, but some of the artifacts. Um, this is Hurricane Hill. Um, the winter of 1942, 43, <laughs> right. Herb and Lois uh, Chrysler were there and Herb took this photograph and they were part of the aircraft warning uh, system. So during World War II, in the, uh, spe specifically on the Olympic Peninsula, there was a fear of airplanes coming in from Japan. And so they were on the beaches and in the lookouts, there was a, a, a warning uh, system. So they would have Two people in each lookout, 24 hours, seven days a week, they'd be on shifts. Uh, got a little touchy in some places, <laughs> people, uh, but, and couples were kind of welcome. So uh, the Chryslers were at Hurricane Hill uh, and spent the winter there. Uh, that's all that remains today. It's a very popular hike today, very pleasant hike <laughs> in, the, in the summer, uh, and you just get to this platform. One last part of this development of historic trails is we do get to roads eventually. Some of these roads are trails today. Anybody want to guess what road this is? It's a highway that we... Well, not really. <laughs> There's water everywhere on the west side. <laughs> this is Highway 410, uh, which was known as the Immigrant Road uh, with an E. And it is the road that the uh, folks coming over Natchez Pass then eventually took this route down along the White River, um, and the Greenwater River, and then the White River, and then into uh, Southern Puget Sound. So, and this became then the, it was called the Immigrant Road for a while, and it became the preferred highway over uh, the South Cascades uh, through Chinook Pass. So, um, so it's a highway today, but there is that Natchez Pass Trail. There's a little small part of it in Federation Forest State Park along Highway 410. This one you probably recognize, or just take a guess what highways go through the passes today. It's not Highway 2. <laughs> this is I-90. <laughs> well, it says the loop on the Sunset Highway. I mean, this is, I-90 I is not on this actual pass, but uh, there were a highway through there. It was called many things. It was called the Serpentine Road. It was called the Sunset Highway. And this part, this loop still exists below I-90. So if you take that Snoqualmie Wagon Road Trail I showed you earlier, 
And you, uh, when you get to the end of it, you can walk this part of the road. Um, there are a few cars on it, but nothing like I-90. And it goes to the headwaters of the middle fork of the Snoqualmie River, which is what the Native Americans were following to get through Snoqualmie Pass. So, so we do have some roads to hike today. Um, and I just want to mention those. Uh, okay, in terms of, so this survey of historic kinds of trails, I just wanted to highlight a few of, of them that are close to Leavenworth. Um, this is a, a stagecoach route that went over Kalakam Pass. And so you can take, you can hike, I would not recommend driving the uh, <laughs> Kalakam Pass road, but it is, it is a road, it's a green dot road. And you can, you can drive it if you've got a Jeep, which uh, Kay helped me uh, navigate a, a Jeep up the west side, but I put the hike in the book from the east side. Um, this was a road um, uh, commissioned in, in 1888, this is between Wenatchee and Ellensburg over the Wenatchee Mountains. And it's an ancient route too, 1814, uh, Ross, the fur trader came through here over, over the mountains because the river's got too many rapids. Um, the cliffs come down too close to the river. can't walk along it, so you best to go over the mountain. He was coming in 1888, uh, pay somebody to build a road, and uh, cars went over it for a while. <laughs> and there's some good stories from that. But it's a long hike today, because uh, I'm not willing to drive very far up this. But you get up into the highlands, uh, up and uh, towards the pass, and it's, it's a beautiful area with huge vistas of the river. Uh, cattle drives were going through here, too an elk preserve at the top. Um, other one that near here, you will recognize this. Iron Goat Trail, yeah. Yeah, Stevens Pass. This is the Great Northern. Uh, this is what's left of snow sheds. Uh, the whole trail is not like this, uh, but the, you have these concrete uh, stanchions. And I, I suspect you're somewhat familiar with this, but this, uh, the Iron Goat Trail is the Great Northern with James J. Hill building it. Um, uh, railroad engines were called iron horses, but because of the determination and the stubbornness required and uh, grit to, to build this, uh, they called it the iron, iron Goat Trail. And Hill was financing it on his own, not government financed. Uh, and uh, so it was quite an engineering feat besides the quote discovery of Stevens Pass uh, to find a way through. Then they built trestles. Um, 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 zigzagging back and forth up the mountain, then built a tunnel. And you may know the story of the uh, Wellington disaster uh, uh, when uh, more than a hundred or about a hundred people were killed by an avalanche coming down over a train that was stalled on its way to Seattle uh, by snow on the tracks, which they could not, despite all their efforts, could not get off fast enough. So they were trapped for several days and avalanche came down swept several cars uh, off the uh, tracks and down into the valley. So it was the worst disaster in, in railroad history at that point, at which point they built the tunnels, um, increased this, uh, you know, reinforced, oops, reinforced the uh, uh, snow sheds and then built the longest at the time, the longest tunnel, railroad tunnel in the world, uh, which is still there. And that's where the trains uh, go through today. And it's well, a wonderful hike up to Windy Point. You can sit there. And if you're lucky and you're patient, you can wait until a train goes, you can see the train going through the tunnel uh, down below. So, and it's, uh, this is a trail that was built uh, for over a period of about 20 years with efforts uh, by volunteers for Outdoor Washington and Ruth Itner, led by Ruth Itner. It's a, it's a great trail. Um, this is the trailhead at uh, Scenic, which was a resort hotel uh, built to serve uh, railroad passengers. It's on high, right off Highway 2, right uh, west of Stevens Pass. Uh, you can find this caboose there. And then the third trail that's kind of in this area um, is uh, what I call the Ladies Pass Trail. This is the story of Hal Sylvester, uh, who was a Forest Service Ranger. He had worked for the USGS. Uh, and then when Theodore Roosevelt and 
Fanchot created National Forests in 1907. Uh, he started working for them. And one of his main jobs was to put things on the map and give them names so that if there was a fire, uh, you could find uh, more easily where it was. So I like, uh, this is Sylvester in the 1930s leading a pack train, um, but the hike, whoops. Oh, did I go past it? Yeah, the hike was back here. The hike is up the Icicle uh, Creek Road uh, trailhead. Uh, you can do a loop um, starting at what? Horse camp there, I'm getting the name of it. You come out Shatter Creek and then you go in the one that's, well, you go through, yeah, you, yeah, you go, you're supposed to go across French Creek or is it Broken Bridge, but it's, he, he was on horseback and um, in two days, he named nine different lakes in this area. So you can find Lake Mary, Lake Margaret, Lake Florence, Lake Ida, one for his wife, Lake Alice, and, uh, and that's why it became known as Ladies Pass. He, he wrote about his, uh, how he named things. He named more than 3,000 places, most of them in the Wenatchee National Forest. It's a great story. And he had all kinds of names, but uh, he began naming the lakes after women because women there were- one, There is one named after him. Yes, yes, there is. And it overlooks Lake Alice, right? That's <laughs> <laughs> what I'm told. Yeah. Um, and I'm not sure which lake this is actually, because uh, this is Craig's photo, but uh, it's, it's a nice, it's a nice hike. Uh, he unfortunately died on a, a riding accident um, yeah, up uh, the Chewakam Creek Trail up to, um, towards Ladies Pass in, uh, let me see, 1944. Uh, I describe it in the book if you wanna read disasters. So uh, how am I doing on time? Oh, oh, not so good on time. Okay, I'm just gonna tell you. Uh, well, <laughs> I, I, I don't know how we're still on an uh, shelter in place here. <laughs> okay, well, if you get tired, let me know. Uh, so I'll talk about Kalakam Pass, uh, uh, not Kalakam Pass, Cowlitz Pass in a little bit more detail. This is my current favorite hike um, because it is so old. Um, this is Cowlitz Pass on the uh, Yakima Cowlitz Trail, and it's been in use for 7,000 years. I think that's an historic trail by, by definition. Uh, you can see historic route of the Yakima Cowlitz Trail. It goes from uh, the west side with the upper Cowlitz people over um, Cowlitz Pass, which is just north of White Pass. And then the Yakima people came up from the east side and they met at the top every summer for gathering berries, for hunting, for socializing, gambling, having a good time. Although of course it was a matter of survival for them to get food as they're up here and store it for the winter. So Calus Trail number 44, a forest service trail in Gifford Pinchot Forest goes for four miles along this ancient route. And much of it has also been tracked through the Calus Valley, but um, this is a, a part that is eminently hikeable. Uh, we know about this trail through an interview given by a man named Jim Yoke, pictured here with his wife, Annie, and an adopted uh, granddaughter, uh, who spoke to the um, anthropologist um, Melville Jacobs in the 1920s. And a Yoke identified 300 places along this trail by name, by giving them the name. And the names were like a good fishing place, a berry picking place. And so that's how, that's one way of identifying this trail today is, is how many, and Eugene Hahn, I think is working on a book that will use, will try and identify all 300 places. And you'll notice that he is sitting, uh, kind of, you'll notice in front of a teepee, uh, but he's, out, he's on the west side of the Cascades near, uh, near Packwood. Uh, and the, <laughs> well, come on in. <laughs> I guess you got here safely. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, welcome. We're <laughs> so he's sitting in front of a teepee, but he's on the west side. And what had happened over the years is these people for thousands of years meeting together, intermarrying, you got a new people, the Titan of Palm, and they have traits of both west side and east side uh, natives. So the teepee, uh, he's living in a teepee in Packwood. Um, hairstyles and, and hats were other things and language began to, they became bilingual. Okay. <laughs> um, so this, um, you can follow this trail. Uh, as I said, 
this is not part that's on that uh, Trail 44. This is the Blue Hole in La Wiswis Campground, um, southeast of uh, Mount Rainier. It's a beautiful spot. And if you go there, you, can, you get the sense. This is a place where I felt some resonance and that people have been here. People would be here. They would camp here, of course, and they would jump into this hole, uh, blue hole as people do today, or they would fish here. It just has that sense of this is the right place for humans to be. So it's along the trail. Uh, along the way, another way of marking the trail is that is, are these culturally modified trees. Uh, the uh, Calitz, upper Calitz people would cut bark from cedar trees to create a basket for gathering berries. So they cut this rectangular uh, cut. It didn't destroy the tree. And you can find um, on several paths, uh, trails through the Cascades, evidence of these uh, colloquial called basket trees. This is the kind of basket that they make. It's not one of the you know, finely woven baskets that you see. I did find this in a museum in Goldendale because it's not the kind of thing you even put in a museum. It's a very utilitarian basket, but uh, it's a guide to the trail. You get up there, uh, the trail starts at Soda Springs. Um, this was a bathing site for Native Americans. Uh, settlers came into the area and they fenced it off and they started selling the water <laughs> and bottling it. Um, they charged an entry fee and then the, in the 1940s, they. Uh, operated under the name Tumac Mineral, Mineral Springs, and Tumac is the name of a mountain on this trail. Uh, the Tumacs were two sheep herders who would race their sheep to, to the meadows in the summer. So Tumac, Mount, Tumac Mineral Springs. Uh, their bottled water didn't sell too well. Uh, they had a, a, a slogan, be healthy, be wise, uh, be happy, be wise, and let Tumac help you normalize. <laughs> help you normalize but in fact uh, the water was kind of brown and not very attractive looking so it didn't do too well but the springs are still there and they look like this so you, and it's warm water um, at the top of Calitz Pass is a series of lakes you, if you drive over a pass these days you expect to besides the sign at the top that tells you the elevation you can tell when you've gone over a pass you know you're up and then you're down um, Calis Pass is not quite that clear. Um, it's, it's more of a plateau with a whole series of lakes and ponds at the top, and you can understand why people could spend uh, lots of time there. Uh, it's in the shadow of, of Mount Rainier. And uh, people there were gathering huckleberries, blackberries, salmonberries, elderberries, strawberries, salal berries, hazelnuts, honey, deer, elk, and mountain goat. You can see why it was a wonderful place uh, to be in the summer. And the, yes. Were the hazelnuts native? <laughs> I assume so. Yeah, I didn't realize that they grew here natively. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Well, I'm reading this from some anthropologist, so, so I, I assume it is, yeah. Um, and then this is the, the trail does continue on. Uh, this is a trail along the Tumac Mountain. I told you about the sheep herders. William O. Douglas used to come up this trail then from the east side when he was a boy in Yakima or a young man. And he, did, he came up one summer um, on his own and met the sheep herders there and brought a newspaper. Oh, here's our alert again, maybe we're, we're free. Yeah, and he, anyhow, he read this newspaper that told the sheep herders about the outbreak of World War I. So what's it telling us? advising to either shelter in place or avoid the immediate downtown area. Is that right now? I think there's a delay. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's right. Okay. Okay. No, no. Okay. Well, we'll assume there's no new. We'll check it. <laughs> we'll check in a bit. Um, so this trail is well documented from the west side, not so well from the east side, um, the, the Yakima side. Um, they there was an ancient village of uh, Miawax, which is now buried by the Rimrock Dam. Um, and we believe that the trail from the east side came up Indian Creek, makes sense, to the summit. Um, and there is an effort by people in the uh, William O. Douglas um, uh, website or will, uh, groups that are trying to trace both Douglas's trail up and the native trail up from the east side. I mean, it, it's, you can, they have a pretty clear idea of where it went, but it's not a trail today. So uh, more historical work to be done. 
Okay, I've got other trails I can do in depth, but it's 7.55, so I'd be happy to stop and take questions at this point or something else you want me to talk about. If people do have questions, I'm gonna sort of put the mic near you so the virtual people can hear your question. <laughs> you virtual people out there <laughs> who are free to ask questions too. I'm yes. sorry if you got here so late. I'm um, sorry too. <laughs> have a hard time getting here. Yes. Um, but where exactly is this? This I'm, one? Yeah. Uh, this, you're looking at the Rim Rock Dam, the lake there. So this is on the Yakima side. So it's uh, Highway 12, off of Highway 12, just okay. east of the, uh, east of White Pass. I can go through some others quickly, but I think I, what I'll do is I'll just go through some uh, without telling you too much. How's that? Unless there are some online questions. Okay. Okay. Yes, San Juan Island, English camp and American camp, not historic trails in the technical sense, but great places for roaming. So you know the story of the pig war. Uh, this was a boundary dispute between the US and Great Britain. So you draw on the boundary along the 49th parallel and you get to the water. And what do you do? Well, you give Vancouver Island to the British, but what about the San Juan Islands? Um, both the British and the Americans wanted them. The British had a, a big farm there, Bellevue Farm, it was called. Um, and so for, and uh, at one, and the, but the American settlers or people were just coming in and trying to claim land. Um, and a man named Cutler had a farm with pigs. Uh, no, he had a farm with potatoes and a British pig uh, came into his farm and uh, dug up the potatoes and he shot the pig. And that became a, a, an international uh, dispute. Uh, and so for 10 years, uh, the Americans and the English agreed that they would uh, coexist on uh, San Juan Island. So you have English camp on one end of the island and um, American camp on the other. English camp was quite civilized. Uh, <laughs> they, the British actually made it a pleasant place to be. Uh, the British had their wives there, so they uh, had officers, they had a formal English garden. And you could take a little hike up to a gazebo here uh, on horseback, the officers and their wives in the evening and watch the sunset. So it was quite civilized. Uh, American camp, <laughs> Americans did not put much money into this. Um, and it was, it's a very wide, uh, wide open space and it's, uh, it's great for roaming, but it was kind of a harsh place to live. So this is what's left of American camp. And you can just take off across the, uh, the high, high meadows there, uh, Grandma's Cove. This is a huge uh, fishery uh, on this area of San Juan Island. So just a few pictures showing that. Okay, and then this is sourdough. I'm not gonna talk much about it because this is Craig Romano's favorite hike. He usually talks about this. But this is Phil Whalen on the lookout at Sourdough Mountain, which is the toughest trail in the book. It's a 10, 11 mile round trip, 5,000 foot elevation gain. There's Craig and the views are tremendous of uh, Ross Lake there. And you can see why you'd put a fire lookout up here. You can see the wrong way, so beautiful views, yeah. And then uh, White Bluffs is uh, one that's a new trail in the book. Uh, I had heard about it before, but I didn't, I'd heard about it as a wagon road. I didn't realize there was a trail. Um, this is the ferry that came across the Columbia there. Um, and today you can, you can follow from the ferry landing. There's a boat launch still there. Uh, you, can you can start a trail that goes up uh, over the White Bluffs towards the Saddle Mountain. And you can look over the river and see the abandoned town sites of White Bluffs and Hanford. Uh, this is where people had settled and made um, built orchards. And then in the 1940s, the US government came in and said, you have to leave and we're not telling you why. Um, <laughs> and they did. And so uh, you get some concrete ghost buildings kind of still there across the, across the river. But it's a beautiful area that's preserved, believe it or not, on the nuclear reservation. Um, because nothing has been built there. Um, so this is one of the last natural stretches uh, of the Columbia River, the Hanford Reach. So it's a beautiful area, not many people there for, uh, for wandering. Okay, and I use this slide as just the end of it to show, but the road is washing away here. The I mean, the dunes are, are erasing the road. These trails do change. 
I think uh, we can do our part by hiking them, uh, advocating for preserving them, and, and kind of and just being aware of the historical significance of many of these places. So that's a an overview. <laughs> okay. so, questions? Yeah. Anything you want to talk about? Trails, historic trails you know of? I think the Calix people still gather um, every year. It's by my friend. So uh, somewhere, and I don't know if it's where you're talking about, but I wonder. I yeah I don't know for sure yeah, either. It's probably a small group of people. But yeah. Well, I the Cal the Calix tribe is interested in this trail, and they have uh, you know we've had a few meetings to kind of track it, and they, you know, they did do some heritage activity which was related to cranberry festival, I think. So they yeah they're very much wanting to preserve that. They the Calix never uh, did not get a reservation. They did not cede their land. Um, there are very few people still with some land holdings in the Calix Valley, but they are very active in this uh, in preserving this. Along with you know cooperation with the Forest Service has done a good job too. Well, is it safe to go so, home? Oh. <laughs> so, for trails forming, how they form is this sort of interesting? I mean, there are animal trails, Native American sure. trails. Railroad yes. trails and mining trails. I mean, is it how is that like the, the mix? And is there one that's more predominant or just and one that's more, you know, what strikes me is how layered they are. If you're uh, a fur trader and you want to get your your pelts, I, I, you're gonna take them down the Columbia River, but let's say you your uh, Hudson's Bay Company has cattle raising cattle on the west side east side and they want to go over the west. They're going to be looking for that trail through the mountains and they'll they'll follow the one that the native americans have followed so that you get that and then somebody comes and builds a wagon road and then somebody decides well that might be where we can put a railroad too so or a highway <laughs> an interstate highway so to me it's the ones that have the layered history that is yeah. is the most interesting so, so some, at least some of the highways started out really close to the land because that would be what the native Amer well the animals that originally lived you know, be the, the, the path of least sure, the animals are going to find the path of least resistance. Yeah, yeah. I think that's fascinating. Yeah, I mean, of course, there's some that you will never get back. One of the uh, trails uh, from the Columbia River to get to Puget Sound, and the early settlement was going to Puget Sound. Uh, that's where people wanted to get to in Washington, um, and but they didn't want to have to go over the mountains, so they were coming down the river. And then they would take the what was called the Calitz Trail, it's a different Calitz Trail, uh, up from the river to um, the south end of Puget Sound. Well, that's now Highway 99, I-5. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no way that you can follow that trail today. So there's some. Trail. Trail? Yeah, it's called trail. On trail. On trail. So yeah. it's the origin of trail. Oh, it's, uh, it's really good. The book is about what you're asking. Yeah, that's really good. Okay, so someone is saying there's a book called On Trails. On yeah, that. On Trails. And is that, is that U.S., national, international? Uh-huh. You have. Oh, okay, it's not new. Okay. <laughs> on Trails. Okay, yeah, I don't know that one. That's good. On the East Coast, there's something called Rails to Trails where they yeah. put bike paths. Is that up here too? Oh, yes. There's yeah. a lot of that here. Yeah. Let's not so call me. Like bringing it back together. Kind of like that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, well, Centennial Trail. I mean, not, I think of these now more as bike paths than hiking paths, but Snoqualmie Valley is, I call that a rail trail. Um, even the ca Palooza Cascades, people do that, uh, bike that too, as well as hike or horseback. Mm -hmm. The Centennial Trail, the Burke Gilman Trail. Um, there are lots of them around. I mean, that is one of our main sources of, of recreational trails today are the abandoned railroad grades because they've, they're graded, <laughs> they're wide, um, they go from a town, one town to another. So, it, yeah, yeah. So, I guess we've got maybe we got our money's worth out of the government funding of railroads. I'm not sure. <laughs> 
place to still see wagon ruts. Okay. This is a, yeah, a comment about the uh, Blue Mountains in Oregon, uh, from the Oregon Trail. Yeah, I got into this partly through a group called Nor um, Northwest Octa, Oregon California Trails Association. These are uh, uh, rut nuts <laughs> who look for the ruts of the Oregon Trail, uh, <laughs> usually more by car. And we used to do it by uh, for, uh, to, you know, radio communication before the days of cell phones. So. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah, the org, you know, I searched for, quote, the Oregon Trail in Washington, and you don't really find it except for the Natchez Pass, which was only used for two years, and it was too difficult. Um, or this trail that comes up from Columbia to Olympia, that, that's really the Oregon Trail section that's in Washington. And there are markers in the state, a few, I think there are nine markers for the Oregon Trail. Washington, little, little concrete things. You can find one in Tonino, for example. Great. Okay, is it safe oh, to go thank home? thank you, Judy. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you, virtual folks, as well. Um, uh, we will just sort of assess. Uh, it seems as though Jackie was able to depart, so I think we will be able to leave. I, you do not need to feel like you're stuck here in the barn. Yeah, we'll figure it out. But if you wouldn't mind helping us stack our chairs, that would be really appreciated. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you.